This video will introduce you to Low Power Wide Area Network, or LP1, as a main enabler for IoT technology. I hope you will find this video enjoyable and useful. There is no doubt that having more data and knowledge will allow us to make better decisions. Data about our transport systems, logistics, agriculture, smart grid, and so on. This data will distill into valuable information that will help in increasing our efficiency and live in better cities and enhance the sustainability of our economy. Low Powered Wide Area Network, or LP1, are the networks that specialize in connecting remote things that are mobile and are not usually connected to the permanent grid. Examples of these here, we found the livestock or and agriculture. If you put a sensor in a field, it is highly unlikely that you will have a permanent connected power and you would like to have a sensor that have a very uh, long communication range and very low power consumption. There are three main objectives of low powered wide area networks. First, you'd like it to have to be low power. What does that mean? It means if you put a battery, you want this battery to last for a few years. If you put a battery in the field, you want this sensor and a battery to last for a few years without maintenance cost of replacing the battery. You want this to be wide range, so you don't invest in so many towers. You want the minimum number of towers to maximize the efficiency of your network. The third, you would like to have it as low cost as possible. You don't want the sensor to cost more than the asset itself. Now, as a result, you need to know that in, in, in telecom engineering, these are all trade-offs. Having wide range, low power will come at the cost of low bandwidth, that is low speed. But these applications don't really require high speed. You can't use a camera, a video streaming over LP1. It is, LP1 is not designed for high data streaming. It's designed for updates, for example, a sensor that measures temperature and update one byte of data every hour. That's a very low bandwidth, very low speed is required for such network. There is an increasing trend in the LP1. The number of devices that will join the network are phenomenal in the next few years. Just think about one application, for example, utility metering. Let's take an even narrower example, water utility metering. If only the water meters in Victoria joins the network, you'll have millions of new users, user, users much more than the annual increase in the people, the subscriber of mobile telecom operators. Understanding the gap in the current technologies, many of the standardization bodies have developed technologies specifically tailored to low powered wide area networks. Taking examples is the IEEE or what is called the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, which is the largest technical professional organization in the world. The second example here is the 3GPP, which stands for the Third Generation Partnership Project, which oversee all cellular communication standardization. What is more commonly known for LTE and UMTS? They are known as 3G and 4G. 3GPP has developed a technology called narrowband IoT or NB-IoT under the umbrella of LTE and LTE Advanced and will carry on in next generation 5G. The second interesting technology is under LoRa Alliance, which is called LoRaWAN. More to come in the following slides. Broadly speaking, IoT wide area technology, or let's call them the LP1, can be divided as class license. So class license is a term in Australia used by the Australian Communication and Media Authority to refer for free access spectrum, the spectrum that can be used freely without paying for a fees. Under this uh, type of spectrum, we have some uh, of these network can be deployed by the user and some can be uh, deployed by IoT operators. There are no difference between these two, but some of IoT operators are deploying under the free spectrum. These technologies, for example, we have LoRaWAN, Zigfox, and etc. So same technologies also can be deployed by the user. For the license spectrum, we have telcos such as Tesla, Optus, Vodafone in Australia, which are they, they are mainly de in, uh, developing or deploying 
the MBIoT technology. MBIoT will be carried as well under the 5G standard. So what are the main differences between licensed and unlicensed band approached? So for the license, the good thing is that you have a controlled interference. Interference is the most impeding packed factor in telecom wireless telecommunication because you have a limited bandwidth and you have to manage the radio resources as efficient as possible. You, in some technologies, you have a guaranteed quality of service, for example, an LTE. It is more reliable, generally speaking, because you have a, you have a controlled access to the dedicated spectrum for your services. The cons, of course, you need to pay for the license as an operator, and thus you need to charge the subscribers, and it is a bit more expensive than the unlicensed. Of course, you need to rely on the mobile operators. You can't just take these technologies and deploy it. They are, usually these devices are much more expensive, the gateways and the base stations, than the unlicensed uh, version. So the unlicensed or license exempt, uh, the good side, it's free to use. It's like Wi-Fi, for example. So faster time to market, because users can just take these devices, buy them and deploy them. You can build your own network. Now, the cons can be, it's very unreliable in some dense areas because of the high interference. Quality of service cannot be guaranteed because you don't have exclusive access to the spectrum. The performance might degrade with time. As more IoT devices join the network, you will find that the interference might increase in some areas. Now, there are some suggestions to increase the ISM band or to operate on other frequencies. But for the time being, most of the IoT applications are operating in the ISM 915 to 928 MHz in Australia. There, there are two main technologies that I would like to compare the performance of. They're both very famous and very popular. The first technology uses the licensed band and is mainly deployed by telecom operators, which is MB IoT. So this is overseen by the 3GPP. As we saw before, 3GPP also standardized the LTE UMTS, so LTE is commonly known 4G, uh, UMTS commonly known as um, 3G, and also the upcoming system, which is the 5G. While LoRaWAN uses the free spectrum and is overseen by the LoRaWAN Alliance. Starting with the MBIoT, the pros of this technology, it can be easily deployed on top of existing LTE, meaning if you have a tower with an LTE based station, you can sometimes you can do just a software upgrade and you will have LTE being installed. It also supports user services such as billing. This is very important in um, measuring the consumption of uh, the users and charging them. The traffic roads can be planned and managed by the operator because you have a dedicated access, exclusive access to the uh, precious spectrum. So you can plan and um, estimate the quality of service in your um, band. It also supports supported by expert telecom operators. These telecom operators have been in the market for tens of years. They know how to maintain these towers and they, they know how to provide good quality of service. The, it is, this, this is a very big opportunity for operators in Australia, for example, Tesla, Optus and Vodafone. The drawbacks, of course, you need to pay for a spectrum if you are adding additional spectrum. Most of the operators are not adding additional spectrum. They're using some of the existing spectrum and dedicating it for the MBIoT. Also, you need to pay for the subscription from the user perspective. Regarding LoRaWAN, so LoRaWAN uses the free spectrum access. It's very low cost. Modules are super cheap. You are using free spectrum. It has very low power consumption. They are excellent in the power consumption, so batteries can last actually for a very long time. It has a very simple protocol as well. The drawbacks of this technology is that it needs to be deployed. You need to deploy a network of gateways, so you need to physically install these gateways. It's not a big task, but it's an additional piece of infrastructure. If you are deploying this by yourself, mean as an end user, you have to manage the network. And managing network is not an easy thing, especially if when you reach hundreds of gateways. Uh, you need to monitor these gateways and provide maintenance as due course. So also you need a backhaul. So these devices cannot just communicate by yourself. You put the, you put the um, LoRaWAN tower to access or to connect for the devices. That's okay, but then you need to relay this into a central system. Now, relaying your connection 
it's not usually done by fiber it's totally uh, not necessary it is most likely done by uh, use of 4g so you still rely on a cellular network but what you are connecting here is a standard cellular connection your connection from this side which is called the access is connected using the LoRaWAN. The um, drawbacks, the um, important draw is the interference. As I said, this is an open um, uh, band. So in the future, there is no guarantee that this band will become more congested and thus you will have more interference. Now it's not the um, interference, just to show you the, the impact of interference is increased packet drops. For example, if you're sending 50 updates, you have a water meeting, meter and sense sending 50 updates to your gateway, you will have only 40 or 30 being received. With increased interference, this number might drop down, for example, into 25, depending on the interference level. LoRa stands for low power radio, and it's a modulation scheme. This is, this is a way of sending bits over the air. I'm not gonna go into these technical details. They are widely available on the internet and can be looked from the standard. The most important thing to know about LoRaWAN, it's a very simple protocol that will make the de device fabrication much easier. It can add the, you would need to add reliability on top of the, um, the um, layer two. So that's a software control reliability. It uses start topology. Start topology means you have a central location, which is the gateway and the devices, which are the things or the sensors connects to this central gateway. So it forms a star. That's, that's why it's called a star a topology. So the the one of the other technologies, a topology is called mesh. So mesh technology means devices can talk to each other, but LoRaWAN does not allow this or does not support natively this. And the reason is to save battery consumption. So all the sensors need to report to the central base station. Central base station forwards these transmissions to the, uh, the, to the main uh, server. This is, this is the most advantage here, is it optimized for low battery consumption. This is the most important feature in uh, LoRaWAN. It is bi-directional, you can uplink and downlink, although many of the applications are uplink, which are reporting of measurements in the field towards the, gate, to the, towards the network. There are three classes, I'm not gonna go into that details, but the, it, most commonly there's one class being used in the market at the moment. A bit of more details. So LoRa, LoRaWAN is not an application. Application sits on top of LoRa, is a way of connecting to the network. For example, you're using your phone to browse the internet. Your browser is the application, but the phone connectivity towards the tower uses 4G. This is similar, LoRaWAN is a connectivity. In connectivity, you have two layers usually. So one called the media access control layer or the MAC layer, which define when to start transmission, when to stop, how many bits to send, how much information, overhead information required, and so on. The other layer, which is the lowest layer, is called the physical layer, which defines how do you modulate or how do you ch change zeros and ones and transmit them over the air. It also defines regional parameters. For example, it defines what channels, what radio channels to be used, and every country will have different uh, channel allocations. LoRaWAN communication protocol is actually quite simple. You have a device, that is sleeping most of the time. So if you put the X axis as the time, the device is sleeping, it wakes up, takes some measurements, and then transmit power, and then go back to sleep a little bit, start trying to receive, receive again, and then go back to sleep. So you have here this stage which the device is sleeping, it wakes up, it transmits, it reports the measurements, and then waits for some updates from the gateway. So these are optionals optional updates, for example, acknowledgement of reception of, this, uh, of the transmitted data, or to have a, um, a window for receiving some updates on the new parameters of the network. But it's usually, these are very small to none. So what you end up with, a device that's sleeping most of the time, wakes up, transmit, and then go back to sleep. Now, this is an extremely simple protocol when compared to 3GPP protocol. The general architecture of a uh, typical uh, LoRaWAN uh, system. So you have the gateway. The connection between the gateway and the devices is called the access system, and in this case is a LoRaWAN system. The gateway is backhauled, means it's connected via usually wireless connection, could be a 4G connection, Ethernet, a cable or a Wi-Fi, to the internet, 
And then on the other end, you will have the server, which collects the data and presents it to the user. Without going into much detail, the purpose of this slide is to show you that electromagnetic transmission decays with the square of the distance. So if you look at this S, is the source of electromagnetic radiation or the source of, of the uh, uh, communication power coming from the device. If you take this area at distance R and then you double the distance and look at what happens to the area, the area quadruples. So what does that mean? That the amount that can be captured by the same area A is now 1 over 4. So mathematically speaking, the relation between the received power and the transmit power is guarded with the square of the distance. You double the distance, the received power will reduce by four times. Now in practical communication condition, it will re reduce more than uh, to the power two because of obstacles in the field. Now, so when you have more distance travel between the um, transmitter, so you have here a transmitter or the IoT device, and here you have the gateway. So the more the distance, the weaker the power. And if when the power is weaker, there's something called the signal to noise ratio becomes lower. If the signal to noise ratio is becomes lower, the device, the gateway cannot hear you properly and thus will reduce your bitrate. We will see the relation between the bitrate and the power in the next slide. This is a typical performance of LoRaWAN. So at, the, at this point, you have your gateway. So this is here, you have the gateway. And if I'm taking my device and going further, further, further from the gateway, what will happen? My data rate will start decreasing. So when I'm very close to the gateway, I can transmit with a bit rate of 50 kilobits per second. The speed is quite good. But when I'm, when I'm going away, when I'm uh, traveling further from the gateway, my bit rate will, will reach a very low level of 292 bits per second. And that's because the reduced transmit the reduced received power. The third generation partnership project, which standardized technologies like LTE and UMTS, LTE is commonly known as 4G, UMTS is commonly known as 3G. So 3GPP is still having this 3G term, it hasn't been updated. But as an organization, they are, they are, they are working towards the standardization of 5G. They have released already the first standard. Now, 5G has a major, uh, major attention on not only on standard mobile broadband connection. So standard mobile broadband connection is your typical phone would like to make it faster. Why? We would like to have higher uh, definition radios, real-time VR, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, and so on. However, 5G or 3GPP under 5G has also re recognized the importance of two main applications. One, they called it massive machine type communication. Massive machine type communication is merely the LP1 technology that we are talking about. So they understood this application in smart buildings, in logistics and tracking, fleet management, smart meters, I mean utility meters, smart air protection, and so on. All of these are actually typical low powered wide area network. But according to three to three GPP terminologies, they call it massive MTC. Massive because the number is very large and expected to be more than the people, more than human in, in certain locations. And MTC because machine type, these are all machines, they are not human, they are communicating to the internet. So you will find this is the technical term. LP1 is another technical term to, to use it. Now most mostly in the commercial aspect, they will call this as IoT. Now IoT is, I would say in the market, 90% refers to this, 10% as well refer to this as an IoT. Now, not to mix between IoT is a big umbrella. But to use a, the, the proper terms are LP1 and massive MTC, which we are covering in this uh, in this spect in this uh, video. Regarding the critical MTC, critical MTC are still machine types. They are still things. That's why they call it IoT, uh, and it refers to the things that require much stringent um, uh, communication. Um, uh, they have much stringent re communication requirement. For example, they require very low latency. If you have a car driving an autonomous, autonomous car and it, uh, the autonomous car is reporting the, um, is communicating with the infrastructure, the delay of that communication would be, should be very low. In fact, less than five milliseconds. And that's what, what we call critical MTC. It is not like a water meter reporting the water level 
every hour. This, this the application requires very fast communication and very reliable communication as well. Under the umbrella of cellular IoT technologies, there are three main te technologies at the moment. There is the second generation, which has been switched off in Australia in around 2016-2017, but still widely used in, around the world. So in, under 2G, 2G second generation are, are devices are quite cheap, and there are some mods in, in GSM or the second generation, which are compatible with IoT, compatible in the sense of low power consumption. So pay attention here, we are focusing on the LP1 still applications. So whenever we are mentioning IoT in this context, we are referring to the low power part of the uh, IoT. The other interesting uh, technologies are under the fourth generation. The first one is CAT M-1 or CAT M1, which is based on the LTE technology. So LTE, the one you use for your phone, which is not actually designed very well for low powered application. So what CGP did, did they took the standard, uh, which is for phone, mobile phones, and they made it more friendly for low powered application. However, understanding still the gap that their technology is not quite competent for the low energy consumption, they have to develop a new technology called MBIoT totally from scratch, which is Inter, as I say interoperable, but it can operate under the umbrella of LTE. But it is actually a new technology and a new standard. And this is particularly catered for low powered wide area network. Future 5G IoT are expected to take this MB IoT and further optimize it for lower power consumption. Energy consumption is quite important in a low powered wide area network. You would like to have a sensor, you put it in the field and forget it for 15 years, ideally. Now that's really hard to do because inside the sensor, you have your CPU, your processor, you have memory, you have your communication module, you have a sensor. And all of these devices require battery to be powered. There are two main factors that impact the energy consumption of your IoT device is the amount of time on air, that is the size of your data. If you're sending one byte of data versus if you're sending 100 bytes, of course 100 bytes will take more time thus will require more battery or more and will consume energy. So the width, if you take the current consumption as the y-axis and the time as the x-axis, you'll find the width of this uh, box uh, or rectangle will be the time on air. The other factor is actually the magnitude of the current or the amount of consumption of the current. Now, usually this current consumption increases with the increase of the distance so if you have a longer distance between the uh, transmitters in, in the IoT device and the gateway or the tower, means you need to, to spend more current in order to send your data towards the tower. So you see here, there are trade-offs. If you put a lot of gateways in your field, what will happen that your, your batteries will be preserved for longer time. However, this will cost you in building this um, infrastructure but on the other hand, if you select to put just a few towers, no problem, you can still communicate. However, you need to replace the battery more often. So you will find there are trade-offs always in designing a um, IoT networks, and these trade-offs are between the OPEX and CAPEX. Over the lifetime of the IoT sensor, there are other things that might be taken into consideration. For example, are you going to do a firmware upgrade for your device? Are you going to increase the payload? For example, if you have a utility um, water utility uh, sensor, or a water meter, and at the moment you're reporting 24 measurements uh, per day, uh, by average one measurement per hour. What will happen in the future if you want to implement 48 measurements per day? So of course this will at least double your consumption of the battery. So you need to see what is the future uh, demand or the future application that you need uh, for the battery consumption. So here we're talking about the battery calculation over a few years, so it's important to do proper planning for that. Also, you need to look at the battery type because the batteries themselves can lose charge even if you don't use them. So this should be taken into consideration in the design. Roughly speaking, in order to calculate the lifetime, you need to know the energy inside the battery divided by the energy per day, and you can roughly estimate this, the lifetime of the battery. Now, these estimations are quite important in large deployment. Imagine you have millions of water utilities and you discover that these calculations are not proper. So you end up sending, uh, wasting a lot of um, resources, sending them to the field to replace the batteries. 
Battery calculations and energy consumption is quite important in the application of LP1. With this, I would like to thank you for watching this video. I hope you find it useful and enjoyable.